So we're on Parsha Vayagash today. Um, the the common translation for that into English is and drew near or and he drew near. The literal translation is and drew near, but it's referring to Judah, drawing near to Joseph, so it's and he drew near. Um, we're going from Bereshit, Genesis chapter 44, verse 18, through to chapter 47, verse 27. Now this, as we all know, is an absolute chocker-blocker blockbuster epic. It's, it's, it, it's, it's unreal. It's probably, I'd say it's in my top 54 of the Torah portions. It's, got, <laughs> it's, it's, def, it's def, definitely up there in the top 54. It's phenomenal. It's quite actually mind-boggling. The content, it just doesn't stop. Year by year, we touch upon it on the cycle, the Torah cycle. You know, we come back to this uh, Joseph saga, and this is one of them, Vayigash. And um, new things come to light each year. It just doesn't stop. It just doesn't end. And it's very hard to cover the uh, the whole um, story of Joseph without touching on the 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 inferences and the, the foreshadowing of Yeshua in, in the, the life and the events of, of Joseph. It's quite difficult because it's practically every line. There's, there's a reference or something inferring to Yeshua, you know. It's a, of all, for me, of all the biblical characters, I think Joseph foreshadows Yeshua more than anyone. It's quite, it's quite mind-boggling, actually, the content. It's unreal and... Um, covering the past of this year. I'm not sure if I've done this in the past, but I've certainly read it and studied it in the past. More things were coming to light and I think I just had to draw a line under it somewhere. So we, although today's past might be longer than usual, it could have it could have gone on for a week and I'm, and I'm being serious, I'm not exaggerating, it could have gone on for a week. But as with most things, that start getting a bit um quantity wise a bit much you have to draw the line somewhere and say it'll have to just cap it there you know um, it's the same when you, you you might be working somewhere and you, you, you're preparing a job and you've got a massive wall to paint for example and you need to prepare the wall first and some walls um, need that prep, much preparation you could be there for weeks and weeks and weeks so somewhere along the line you just got to draw the line under it and say this will have to suffice and uh, in the future, you can always return to it if need be. And that's why we have the Torah cycle. You know, we can come back to it and come back to it and come back to it. And uh, hopefully learn more and get nearer and, and closer to him. That's what it's about. So let's have a review of um, what's gone on before we got to this part here today. Um, so remember that the brothers have come to Egypt in search of food. So there's a massive famine everywhere. Yeah. They encounter Joseph uh, without realising who he is, but Joseph, of course, recognises them. This is one of the cruxes of the, the story. Uh, and so begins the drama, whereby he tests them, doesn't he? Through various escapades, he's testing them. Uh, and then the brothers return home without Simeon. Um, the father, Jacob, he's distraught. Uh, then they find that the money in the sacks has been returned. Uh, they, then they bring Benjamin with them. The cups found in Benjamin's sack. It just goes on and on and on. All these little twists and turns. But they're all very... They're not just for the sake of like, oh, that's a good story. These are all very relevant in our name. As we seek through the scriptures and search and dig, it, it comes to light what, what really is the, 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 deep, the deeper meaning behind these events, you know. We can't possibly touch them all today. Um, but hopefully I'm going to highlight some that we may not have seen before, hopefully, you know. And if you have, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with um, recapping and recalling things, godly things. And then um, to bring us up to date, Judah kindly uh, gives us uh, a little account of uh, what's going on, what, how we got to where we are today. And it goes like this. It starts in uh, chapter 44, verse 18. And this is Judah speaking to Joseph. So it gives us a little recap. So I'll read it out now. Then Judah came near to him, that's Joseph, and said, O oh my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's hearing, and don't let your anger burn against your servant, for you are even like Pharaoh. 
My Lord asked his servants, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, who is young. His brother is dead, and he alone is left of his, of his mother's children, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes on him. And we said to my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. But you said to your servants, Unless your brother comes down with you, you shall see my face no more. So it was when we went up to your servant, my father, that we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, Go back and buy us a little food. But we said, We cannot go down. If our youngest brother is with us, then we will go down. For we may not see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servants, my father, said to us, you know that my wife wore me two sons, and the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he's torn to pieces, and I haven't seen him since. But if you take this one also from me, and calamity befalls him, you shall bring down my grey hair with sorrow to the grave. Now therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life, it will happen when he sees that the lad isn't with us, that he will die. So your servants will bring down the grey hair of your servants, our father, with sorrow to the grave. For your servant became surety to the lad, to my father, saying, If I don't bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father forever. Now therefore, please, let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go to my father if the lad is not with me? lest perhaps I see the evil that will become upon my father. So this beginning of the past basically is a perfect recap of where we're up to that Judah gives us here. And today, we're gonna, what we're going to see today is, um, as I mentioned, this um, story surrounding Joseph is, is um, I think it's unparalleled, to be honest. I think it's unparalleled. It's hard to beat it. And if we consider the four elements of nature, earth, wind, fire and water, there are also four elements, core elements, that make up the, the basis of telling the story. Um, it's well known within the literature in circles that there are four core elements of telling a story, whether it's written or spoken. Um, you've got message, conflict, characters and plot. And these core four lead to seven or eight elements, uh, which are just basically extensions and variations of the, of the four core elements. And the best stories have one or more overarching themes. So for example, here it could be the struggles within one family. This is the overarching theme. Uh, and then a, a, a good story will also have a running plot. Um, this one would be, for example, Joseph's dreams. Uh, the brothers throw him into a pit. They sell him, etc., etc. He saves them and he saves the world. This is the plot. And uh, a good storyline will also have an undercurrent as well. <coughs> for example, the, the brothers think uh, he's, he's, he's alive, but he's still a slave. Um, the dad thinks that he's dead. So this is the undercurrent. It's phenomenal, actually, and it seems like a lot to consider into to putting a good story together. But basically, it's just the four core elements. If we think of the Torah itself, we have 613 elements of the Torah. But really, it's just 10 commandments. And really, that's just one commandment. Love God and love your neighbours yourself. So these are just variations and developments of the, the core elements, basically. Now, we know that some stories are factual, some are fiction. This story of Joseph, of course, is in the former category, it's fact. And as I said before, it, it, you'd be hard pressed to beat this story for its, its drama and the, the, all the elements that go together to make it. Um, it it's just an absolute block, blockbuster epic, it truly is. So that's why it's, it's not easy to cover it in, in one sitting. Now what makes this, for me, what makes it even more mind boggling, this epic around Joseph, is that the whole account is just one little piece of a, a huge jigsaw, really, you know. It's it, it's just all these pieces, pieces in the scriptures fit together to form the scriptures. And this is just one small piece of that jigsaw. Um, so today, 
as well as trying to open up the scriptures line by line and verse by verse uh, we we'll look we're going to look at a couple of tiny parts of this one piece of god's mammoth mosaic and uh, just piece them together yeah, so in doing so we're going to see a lot of once again in this parsha um, as as previously we're going to see a lot of foreshadowing of yeshua in the events and in the life of joseph we're also going to look at the uh, judah's intercession um which we just read out there and we're going to conclude with and what it means for us today thousands of years later okay so that's the preview and uh, the review so vayagash what does this mean? It's a Hebrew word, Vayagash. Well, it's the very first word of the Parsha, and it comes from the root word, Nagash. And Nagash, it's uh, three letters, Nun, Gimel, Shin. And strangely enough, it's the same three letters we see in Goshen, which appears in today's Parsha. Goshen being Gimel, Shin, Nun. This is the place that God provides for his people, you know, to be near to him, to draw near to him, Nagash. Uh, God wants us near him. This word, Nagash, which is the root word for Vayagash, it means to approach, to come near, to draw near, come closer to. And he drew near Vayagash. Judah drew near to or approached Joseph. And the first instance we see of this word is uh, Genesis 18. It's Abraham who, like Judah today, is, is interceding for others. And Abraham came near Nagash, mm. Vayigash, Abraham, and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Mm. So Abraham drew near to God and interceded. And today we see Judah, just the same, he draws near to Joseph. Uh, Judah has, in fact, by now come full circle in his life. He's come full circle. Remember, he hated Joseph, he wanted him dead. He had him thrown into a pit, sold off. Um, Jacob deceived the dad, Jacob, into thinking he was dead, he'd been killed. Uh, then Jacob left the brothers, remember, and involved himself in all these shenanigans with Tamar. But his life takes a turn because through God, through his dad and his brothers, and through Tamar as well, uh, Judah began to turn his life around. And now he's, he's looking to reconcile matters. Uh, he's seeking redemption now. He's had a, uh, a change of heart. He's got a, a contrite spirit now forming inside of him. He's what's it's what he's become what our Jewish brother and sisters call a Baal Teshuva. It's called Baal Teshuva, a master of repentance. This is what Judas become. A master of repentance. So there's a lesson for us all and how it's done. So Vayagash and he drew near to God, basically, because Joseph is a foreshadow of Yeshua. So Judas drawing near to God in effect. Vayagash. Okay, so we're going to read from chapter 45, if you don't want to open your scriptures. Verse 1 to 28. What an epic this is. Too, too epic. Then Joseph couldn't restrain himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him. While Joseph made himself known to his brothers and he wept aloud. And the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers couldn't answer them, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. My gosh. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you saw me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither ploughing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it wasn't you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh, a lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, 
Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen and you shall be near to me, you and your children, your children's children, your flocks and your herds and all that you have. There I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty, for there is still five years of famine. And behold, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it's my mouth that speaks to you. So you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all that you've seen, and you shall hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brothers and wept over them, and after that his brothers talked with him. Now the report of it was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brothers have come. So it pleased Pharaoh and his servants well. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, do this, load your animals and depart, go to the land of Canaan, bring your father and your households and come to me, I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you will eat the fat of the land. Now you are commanded, do this, take carts out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and your wives, bring your father and come. Also don't be concerned about your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. Then the sons of Israel did so. And Joseph gave them carts according to the command of Pharaoh, and he gave them provisions for the journey. He gave to all of them, to each man, changes of garments. But to Benjamin, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments. And he sent to his father these things, 10 donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt, and 10 female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and food for his father for the journey. So he sent his brothers away, and they departed. And he said to them, See that you don't become troubled along the way. Then they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to Jacob their father. And they told him, saying, Joseph is still alive and he's governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart stood still because he didn't believe them. But when they told him all the words that Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the cards that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. Then Israel said, It's enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I'll go and see him before I die. <sighs> Incredible, dramatic uh, storyline this, it truly is. There's so much in it. As I said at the outset, it's impossible to cover it all in um, one, a, a few cycles, never mind just one sitting. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's the whole story of Benjamin and the relevance of his part in all this. I, I can't even touch that today. But we will look at other things. Okay, so verse 2. This is the revelation of Joseph. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. Now, he wept aloud. He's not sad or miserable here or devastated. These are tears of joy. Um, he's overcome with uh, elation, basically. You know, I often see, um, I like to watch football. Um, well, actually, I don't. I used to, but I just watch the best football team in the world. I only watch Liverpool now. Um, I don't watch it. I've, fought, I've sort of fell out, out of love with the game because it's become very commercial. So I just watch uh, my beloved Liverpool. But when I see um, a team playing against Liverpool and they, they can't beat Liverpool, and so they can't win the cup, and then the players are lying on the pitch at the end of the match, crying. <laughs> and I'm thinking, come on, get a grip. Pull yourself together. Just because you couldn't win the cup, you want to start blubbering tears. It's pitiful. You know, you tried your best, that's good enough. If you've tried your best, that, that's good enough. But um, there's always another occasion. You can go again, you can pick yourself up and go again, you know. Um, for me, you cry when you win. Not when you can't win. You cry when you win, you know. You're supposed to be overjoyed, full of elation, you know. So much so that tears come out and you can actually, like so, you can actually like sound like you're weeping. Something really beautiful, victorious, something, you know, and it makes you cry. Um, so for me, Joseph wept through overwhelming joy, you know. When we see the word wept, you think someone's sad and they're sobbing, but this was joy, elation. 
This is an all-round great victory, and Joseph is overcome with elation. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. So Joseph makes himself heard. Now remember, Egypt represents the world. Biblically, most of the time, Egypt represents the world. So the world hears, the world's going to hear. And you consider the book of Revelation. All the loud voices and the loud sounds we hear. Um, especially Revelations 1 and 11. Revelations 1, the loud voice as of a trumpet. And it's just you being revealed. Revelation 11, loud voices, roars, rumblings, Yeshua's revealed to the world, you know. Vaishmayu, Vaishmayu. They heard, and they heard. The world is going to Shema. Shema is right in the middle of that Vaishmayu, which is the Hebrew translation here of this verse. He wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard it. Vaish Shema, Shema, Vaish Meu. Yeshua is going to reveal himself, and the world will Shema. They're going to hear, as well as seeing, they're going to hear with understanding and realize, oh, it's him. Ah, it's him. Just as Joseph revealed himself after that loud sound. It's the same here. They go, oh, it's him. Oh my goodness, it's him. It was him all along. He was just testing us, it's him. So, in your own time, just refer to Revelation 1 and Revelation 11 and see how it tallies. Uh, verses 3 here to the beginning of verse 5. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, I need yourself. I need yourself. A big line. Only a couple of words, but this is a big, massive line in the Bible. I need yourself. Does my father still live? But his brothers couldn't answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. Well, you would be, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. And Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. So they came near, Nagash, Nagash. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. Dot, dot, dot. All these allusions to Yeshua. I need Yosef, it's me, it's me. And the Yosef, I am Joseph. And the Yeshua ben Yosef. John 1, 10 and 11. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own didn't receive him. When Joseph said, I am Joseph, everything that had gone in their, li on in their lives previously suddenly made sense. And then, God's plan then becomes clear to them what had been going on all along. The same when Yeshua says, Ani, Adonai, Ani Yosef, I am God. The eyes of the veil will be open, open and everything will become clear. Ah, now I understand. Now I understand. This is what's happening here. These allusions to Yeshua in the life and events of Joseph. Continuing, uh, 45 verse 5b to 8a. The end of five to begin with eight. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither ploughing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it wasn't you who sent me here, but God. Three times uh, Joseph mentions, it's actually Elohim. Three times he mentions Elohim. This is the divine stamp of approval. It's like a seal, bang. Referring to God. Just briefly to come back to verse 1 to 4 again. Another look at this. This is how dense the content is. You have to re-look at, look at it in different ways. Verses 1 to 4, then Joseph couldn't restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him, while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers couldn't answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. 
repeatedly here in these four verses, Joseph repeatedly calls them brothers, 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 brothers. And then declares, I am your brother, I am Joseph, your brother. He, don't forget who he is and the power he has and what the, the rank here, what's going on. He literally rules over them and he has the power to let them live or die. You know, who does that remind you of? He's got the power to let them live or die. But through love and mercy, he saves them. He says, you're my brothers and I'm your brother. So many allusions to our master. Hebrews 2. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly of our son praise to you. John 20. Jesus said to her, don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Matthew 12, 49. We also see this in Mark 3. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So, this is almighty God, the, ruler, the, the maker of the universe. Heaven above, earth be the waters above, the waters below, heaven and earth, the sun and moon, the, sky, the stars. is incomprehensible. And I sometimes had to contemplate, to try to truly grasp the depth of his love. Just to f f remember that he's almighty God and yet he calls us brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And elsewhere he calls us friends. He, he, he comes down as mighty, as incomprehensibly mighty as he is. He comes down, kneels before us and washes our feet. He gives his life for us that we may live with him forever. I mean, we, we've got to remember who he is. How, how amazing that there truly is. I mean, he is Isaiah 9. This is, this is who he is. This is a glimpse of who he is. And to us a child is born, a son is given. The government will be on his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Hallelujah. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is who we're talking about. Or the, uh, this is my favourite version of that same verse, the Aramaic Bible and plain English version. His name was called The Wonder. The Counselor, God, the Mighty Man of Eternity, the Prince of Peace and the Father of Eternity. Mm. That's who we're talking about. Well, That's just a glimpse. He's got hundreds of titles. This is just a glimpse. Mm. What an awesome God we save. Don't forget, the nation, God's people was born amid surrounding nations who had to appease their God, to fend them off, to keep them away. You know, yeah, give him this and he'll, you, you know, he won't punish us. Give him this and he'll stay away from us. Give him this and he might do this for us. Our God says, come near to me. He wants to dwell with us. This is the God we save. Hallelujah. He's altogether too wonderful. He's, he's all to, let's not take it for granted who he is and what he is. He is so unfathomably almighty and yet so humble as to call us friends and siblings. It's, it's beyond me. It's beyond comprehension, truly. And this is why his brothers couldn't answer him when he revealed who he was. Same with Yeshua. 45.3. But his brothers couldn't answer him for they were dismayed in his presence. Yeah. Think of Luke 24. This is after Yeshua's resurrection when he appears to the disciples, his friends, his brethren. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? They were dismayed in his presence. It's the same scenario going on. They were dismayed. Oh, oh, okay. Now this word dismayed, it doesn't really do it justice as to how they felt. Uh, the brothers in front of Joseph when he revealed himself. Or also the disciples in front of Yeshua when he revealed, said who he was, it's me, it's me, and he. This word dismayed, here's some synonyms for it. I'll give you an idea of what, how they felt. Anxious, apprehensive, discouraged, distressed, 
fearful, frightened, horrified, intimidated, nervous, perplexed, perturbed, scared, shocked, spooked, startled. So where it says they were dismayed in his presence, you could have put all them in. They were bum, 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 in his presence. Well, you would be, I would be. I'll be all of those. They thought he was dead, and here he is before them. <laughs> it's me. Oh, you know, Joseph, Yeshua. And Joseph has to convince them, because they're in disbelief. They're just totally in disbelief, and he has to convince them. Verse 12. And behold, your eyes and the eyes of my be brother Benjamin see that it's my mouth speaking to you. It's, it's me. It is me, by the way. Look, this is my mouth speaking to you. Your witnesses... So Joseph has to convince them, it is me, look, just like Yeshua, John 20. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here, look at my hands, reach your hand here, put it to my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. There's so many instances of foreshadowing Yeshua in the events in life of Joseph. You can look at this verse 4 again. Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Near to me, they came near. This is Nagash again, Nagash. The root of today's Pasha, via Gash, it comes from Nagash. Joseph saying, come near to me. Yeshua says, come near to me. Yeshua wants us to Nagash, to him, to approach him, to draw near. We are to come closer to him. He says it himself. Matthew 11, come to me, come to me. Nagash, all you who labour are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. It's beautiful, it's beautiful. Verse 9, <laughs> only on verse 9. Verse 9, hurry and go to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph. In other words, go to the father in my name. Go to the father in my name, in the name of, it's like when we pray, it's like the Lord's prayer. Go to the father in the name of the son. You know, in Yeshua's name we pray. Go to the Father in my name. Yeah. Go to my Father and say to him, thus says your son, Joseph. Praise you. He even says to us in the Gospel accounts, and what you say in my name shall be done for you. And uh, he's the one who makes intercession for us. <laughs> yes, he does. Yeah. Praise you. This is a part of a uh, big intercession. Yeah, we saw him with uh, Judah and uh, Joseph here. He also makes mention about uh, anything that I ask for my father, he will do for me. Yes. And it's like he tells us to pray in his name and he's the one that goes to the father saying, that thus is, says your son Joseph. That's exactly the point, brother. That's, thank you, that's exactly your, the point. Thus says your son Yeshua. Praise you. Holy, and go to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph. Go to the father in my name. Go to the father in the name of his son just as we pray. Verse 20. Also, do not be concerned about your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. Literally, that translation there should literally be, let not your eye be sparing. That's the literal translation. In other words, don't worry about leaving any of your stuff behind, any of your baggage, don't worry about it. And we see in the Gospels, don't we, where Yeshua dispatches the disciples, no need to carry a staff, or a wallet, or bread, or money. Just, just do the mission, just go on, God's with you. Um, and then later on, worry not about what food you eat, what you're going to drink, don't worry about your clothes. In other words, just go forth in the simplest, humblest manner and in faith, because God's going to provide. Amen. So many allusions to the Gospels and Yeshua. The lesson for us here, when you're sent on a mission of God, however daunting it might seem, or or incredulous or strange, God will provide all you need, mm -hmm. and more, <laughs> and more. Verse 24, there's a couple of versions here, you've got the New King James, which we, we usually quote from, and also the King James. So he sent his brothers away, and they departed, and he said to them, see that you do not become troubled along the way. KJV. So he sent his brethren away, they departed, he said to them, See that you fall not out, by the way. So you think, well, which, which is it? Is it do not become troubled or is it don't fall out? So we go to Hebrew, 
the original version. And where it says, fall not out or do not become troubled, that verb there is ragaz. Ragaz. And it means excited or agitated. So he's saying, don't become excited or agitated. And it also means to quiver or to tremble with anger or fear. Which makes sense because anger or fear induces trembling or shaking, doesn't it? When you're really angry or really fearful, you, you, you quiver, you tremble. So this is what he's saying to them. He's more or less, so essentially he's saying, don't get angry with each other and start arguing on the way. And you think, well, well why would they start quarrelling on the way? He says, don't quarrel on the way. Well, why would they quarrel on the way? You think everything's hunky-dory. Jokes is alive, he's, he's going to save us, going to get bread. We're going to eat, we're going to live, he's going to give us the best of the Egypt. We're going to bring me dad back, he's going to be made up. So you think, well, why would they argue? Why would they quarrel? Well, Joseph was justifiably concerned that they might quarrel on the way. Because they're going to be talking to each other now. Well, you were the one who said throw him in the pit. And no, you, you said let's sell him. And you wanted to kill him in the first place. And the pointing fingers, they're going to do this. And he knows they're going to be blaming each other as they're traveling along and recalling the part that each one played. And just reminds me of when the disciples are arguing who would be the greatest. The, yeah, 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 yeah. It's like the opposite. Yeah. And he's there with the Saviour. And they're still, you know, they've still got a bicker, haven't they? Still have to bicker. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so he, Joseph knows that well, these are going to start pointing fingers at each other now. He said, that, That's not what I want. And also, don't forget the, the deeds, and they were, they were wicked deeds that he committed, the brothers. They're going to have to confess them to the father when they get back. Well, you told me he was dead. He, just, he showed me his tunic full of blood. Remember the animal? But they're going to have to confess to him. And ima imagine the guilt they felt for all those years every time they saw the dad's face like that, thinking, oh gosh, you know, he, Joseph's still alive, but we can't be told him he's dead. No, so they're going to be pointing fingers and arguing and all kinds, and Joseph said, whoa, none of that. I know what you're thinking. You sure had the thoughts. I know what you're thinking. I don't want none of that when you're on the way. So, you know. I'm seeing that prophetic picture of how um, we are on our way to see the Father. Yeah. Oh, are you on that one, are you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, I'll let you finish. <laughs> As Joseph just said there, do not quell on the way. On the way. Yeah. We're on the way. We're on the path. There is one way, he is the way. Like Joseph just said, we're on the way, we're on the path, and they're on the path to their father. Yeah. We're on the path to our father. So the lesson here is we shouldn't be bickering among ourselves. We're all on the path. We all want to get to our father. We don't bicker among ourselves. We're supposed to build each other up and edify one another. There's the lesson here. Do not quarrel on the way. You're supposed to be on the path to your father. Do not quarrel. Same with Yeshua in John 13. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. This is what Joseph's saying. Look how I've loved you. Now don't you start messing around with each other. I want you to love each other. No. You're on the way to your father. Verse 26. And they told him, saying, Joseph is still alive and he's governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart stood still because he didn't believe them. Now, as a side note, Hebraically, the heart is the seat of thought and intentions. It's not the head as we were taught in the West or as we believe in the West. It's the heart. Just like the kidneys is the seat of emotion, etc. The heart is your thoughts and your intentions. That's where they come from. This is why God weighs the heart. But Jacob's heart stood still because he didn't believe him. They'd lied to him before, and this is the fate of people who lie. This is their fate. When a liar speaks the truth, he's not believed. The brothers lied to the father when they dipped Joseph's coat in the blood of a goat and he believed them. But now he's telling them the truth, he doesn't believe them, <laughs> you know. It's like the, uh, the boy who cried wolf, or, or like I like to say, the boys who cried wild beast, <laughs> or like the boys who cried living evil. Yeah, look that one up. The boys who cried living evil. Even a lie is not believed. Verse 26 and 27. 
And they told him, saying, Joseph is still alive and he's governor over all the land of Egypt. Jacob's heart stood still. He didn't believe them. But when they told him all the words which Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the cards which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. Now there's a lot in that little passage there. Jacob's heart fails him, but then his spirit revives when they told him all the words which Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent. So he's thinking, is there something about the carts that made him realise, oh yeah, Joseph's alive then? There might be, and I don't know, there might be, there may be, but I don't know and I couldn't see anything, so I left it. There's homework for you all, homework. Jacob's spirit revived when he saw the carts and heard the words. Uh -huh. So I'm thinking, was there something about the carts? I don't know, but there may have been, you know, because it's when he saw the carts and heard the word that Joseph said, that's when he revived. Yeah. So there's Midrash is talking about, is there something about the cards? And some say, well, do you stack the certain way that Jacob would know, well, it, Joseph has done that. So I, I looked a little bit and thought, well, I just, I'm going to go on the words rather than the cards. <coughs> well, well, I was thinking something similar okay. to that. Like when we, when we, uh, when Yeshua is governor over all the world, um, he comes back uh, with his angels, doesn't he? And his angels go from each corner of the world to gather and collect. And uh, he maketh his angels flames of fire as chariots. So is it symbolic picture of like the end when Yeshua is governor over all the land <clears throat> and we see the chariots of God coming and we hear the word of the Lord? Yeah. Is that when our spirits are revived out of the ground? Is there a prophetic picture of the end there? I, I, I believe there is, but um, it's hard to see how Jacob realised by looking at the carts that it was Joseph who'd sent them. He may have just been like Egyptian. Yeah, that's um, the, the point being, I, I couldn't study it out, so I left it to one side, I drew a line under it. But that's a study for another time, and it's home for, homework for anybody. But So I, went, I looked and thought, I looked at the Midrash, which says that Joseph gave them a sign in what he said, because he said, tell them. Joseph, uh, Joseph sent the brothers, and when they told him all the words that Joseph have said to them, so there's also something in the way that Joseph said. And there's a Midrash that says, Joseph gave them a sign in what he said. Tell me that this. So that when Jacob heard it, he's thinking, that's Joseph. He's cleverly made, he's cleverly made a reference to something that they were discussing when they parted. When Joseph separated from Jacob, the Midrash says they were conversing about something. And that Joseph's mentioned that. And Jacob's gone, that's what we were talking about when we separated, when he left. You know, that's what the Midrash says. But I saw it like this. I'm quite a simple man, so I usually bring things quite down to earth. And sometimes it's, it's applicable and sometimes it's not. But I think here, I think, I go, I go along with the line of thought that there was something in, in the words that Joseph had repeated to the father, through the brothers. And Jacob's heard and thought, wow. And it's pricked his ears. Because for me, we all have certain sayings or uh, phrases, don't we, that we reserve for our close ones. You know? <laughs> Especially married couples or close friends. You say certain things and what are you talking about there? He said, it's just a, a private joke or it's a little something. Or you say some, uh, something a certain way that you, you do with your close ones, you know? We, we, all, we all have that. It's all good. It's it beautiful. Have been a reference to his dreams. It may have been, yeah. That's what I'm wondering. Yeah, it's, but yeah, it may have been. Something that only Jacob could know. Yeah, it, 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 it could have been. Yeah, it's something in what he said, but I, I see it like this, and I might be wrong, it's only a, a submitted for your consideration. I see it like this, same. Um, like, I, I think of Joe. Now, if Joe said something like, um, um, curiously beloved, once we extrapolate, the text becomes clear, are we beginning to see, beloved? <laughs> now, if I said that, it wouldn't, you think, that's the kind of thing Joe says, why is Tommy saying that? Because Joe, <laughs> Joe says that, doesn't he, he often, you know? Well, all the time, actually. Um, and when referring to, uh, like, a God incident, I often say to Michelle something like, uh, that's scary, but, but in the most beautiful way, you know? And I often say that when something just hits me, you know, something godly, I say, that, that's scary, but in the most beautiful way. You know, not scary in a horrible way, in a beautiful way. Um, now, 
the brothers related to their father, the words of Joseph, I believe it meant something like this. Dad, it's true, and he is alive. He sent all these carts and he said, he said to us, tell dad I'm alive and I'm well, and tell him, curiously beloved, through extrapolation, the text becomes clear. <laughs> or, are we beginning to see, beloved? And Jacob's thinking, no, nah, only Joseph says that. <laughs> only Joseph says that. You know? Or they could have said to him, Dad, it's true, and he is alive. He sent all his carts and he said, tell Dad I'm alive and well and tell him it's been a scary few years. Scary, but in the most beautiful way. And Jacob's thinking, no, only Jake, only Joseph says that. You know, so Joseph's astute, you know, he's astute. And I believe that somehow he's conveyed to Jacob that the brothers were telling the truth by using certain words that would confirm it. That's just an idea. Given that he would have thought he was convinced that his son was dead, yeah. it'd have to be something. Something that, that st st struck him like that and made him go, bing, whoa. Okay. And also, he's the dad. And when it originally happened, he said, look, is this his garment that's dipped in blood and um, he's died and all that. It's hard for one person to convince someone when they're lying, but for, for 10, how I many was there, 10, 11 of them? All the brothers together, he's, pro he's probably looking around thinking, something's not right here. Something's not right. You know, he's the dad and he knows them. He's seen them growing up. He knows when they're lying and when they're not, and when they're sort of like, won't look at them and being a bit sheepish. You know, so although he was told that Joseph was dead, I think in his heart and deep down he's thinking, is he? What have they done? Did they kill him or has he just ran away or what's happened? I reckon he had a, a, a glimmer of doubt and so therefore a glimmer of hope. And then when this has come to pass, he's thinking, I knew something was, wasn't right when he originally said he was dead. And then when they've said these certain words, he's gone, oh my goodness, that's Joseph. Only Joseph would have said that, you know. Isn't it curious as well how none of their sin gets raised before the father? I know that we discussed that they're actually going to the father with the tail in between the legs and now they've got to say, oh, well, look, this is what we did. We dipped his cloak and we sold him. But none of that, none of that is even mentioned to the father. In, in the scriptures? Like, yeah, and it's like... That's what you mean. Yeah. I'm sure they did confess. Well, it's like, it's not there because, yeah. like, when we go before the Father, uh, he, he paid the price for us, didn't he? And it's like, none of our sin will be accounted. Um, so i just seen... Beautiful. Just, yeah, just a picture saying, in yeah. the text there. Yeah. You, know, you don't see them saying this to the Father. So it's Joseph, the son, his son, beloved, that reveals it. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, he also does the same to those in, in Egypt as well. He mentioned, He only says that he was kidnapped... Uh, as a Hebrew, he never mentions anything to anyone about wow. what his brothers did to him for the wow. whole time. So when it is revealed, he tells everyone to go away, thus maintaining the, the, the sanctity and the, uh, the reputation of his brothers. The, the face, the saving face, beautiful, beautiful brother, bless you. Verse 27, the end of 27, going into 28. The spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. Then Israel said, it's enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Now, we've seen this elsewhere in the Bible, haven't we? An interchange of the names Jacob and Israel. And I've read before that it, it signifies that he, he's, he's conquered here. He's, con he's, he's overcome something. Um, for, for the, in this example, grief. I, when his crushed spirit was revived, Jacob now becomes Israel. Mm. And I used to go along with that, but... There's an example here that puts doubt on it, sheds a bit of doubt, so I'm not really sure that we put too much emphasis on the reason being that that's why the names change. As if like, well, he's called Israel when he's in the happier and more celebratory occasions, and he's called Jacob when he isn't. Because if back in verse 6 of chapter 43, his title is Israel, and yet he's in the midst of torment. Why did you deal so wrongfully with me as to tell the man whether you still had another brother? So he's thinking, no, you're not doing this again to me. Why did you tell him you had another brother? And then he goes on to explain, well, we didn't know. He was, he was just asking this question. We didn't know he was going to ask him to bring him. But the point being, his name's Israel at this point, and he's suffering a lot of grief and torment. 
So to say that he's called Israel when it's all hunky dory and he's called Jacob when it's not, it's too s simplistic to say he's called Israel when everything's great and he's called Jacob when it's not. And there's a verse to say, well, actually, hang on, there might be something else. Yeah. I think it's when he's operating in the flesh and yeah. the spirit. Yeah. Okay, good shout. Yeah, and, and to hear in this part, he, he could be sincere in what he's saying, but if the brother wasn't taken into captivity, none of them would, the outcome wouldn't be free. That they that they found uh, freedom through him. So this is this is what links to the reveal. Okay. So this is Good. still part of God's Good. plan. Yep. And there's more study for everyone there. These things are beautiful to study out. But it's just something to consider, you know. Okay, we're going to continue, and we're on chapter forty-six. I'm going to read verses one to four to begin with. So Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifice to the God of his father Isaac. Then God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob, and he said, here I am. So he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make of you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again. And Joseph will put his hand on your eyes. This is uh, an affirmation uh, of God's promise, and it's also reassurance for Jacob. It's a double thing here. You remember Bethel back in um, Parsha Vayetzi, chapter 28? Just keep your fingers on verses 1 to 4 and remember this. And behold, the Lord stood above it, the ladder, remember the ladder, and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south. And in you and your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. God keeps his promises and his confirmation of that, which would also be a reassurance for Jacob. We see this again, chapter 46 in the Parsha, verses 26 and 27. All the persons who went with Jacob to Egypt, who came from his body, besides Jacob's son's wives, were 66 persons and all. And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two persons. All the persons of the house of Jacob who went to Egypt were 70. Years later, there's 70 people, years later, millions departed in the Exodus. God's promise to Abraham is fulfilled. You know, this is when we see God ful fulfilling and keeping his promises. We see them interspersed throughout the scriptures. Verse 28, then he sent Judah before him to Joseph to point out before him the way to Goshen. Mm. Mm. The way, by the way, to point out the way, the way. Yeah. Again, and Goshen, remember, it's, it's, it's a symbol of the promised land, you know. Like Cain and like the Promised Land, it's surrounded by false idol worship, strangers, sinister customs and traditions all around. This is like an oasis, like a, a, a place where, where God is and his pe he wants his people near him. But this here, sent Judah before him to point out the way. Sent Judah before him, dot, 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 to point, dot, dot, the way. It makes me think of like, to the Jews first, Judah, to the Jews first. They show the way to the promised land. This word there to show the way is leherot, leherot, which also means to teach. Now our Jewish brothers and sisters have been dispersed throughout the world in order to reach and teach and to influence all peoples in Torah. God's instruction manual for his people. He sent Judah before him to point out the way. I just thought that was him. It just stood out for me. Verse 31. Then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and say to him, My brothers and those of my father's house who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. This is another allusion to our master Yeshua. Uh, John 17. John 17 in itself is a must read. For anyone studying out this Parsha, just um, dip into John 17 as well. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece of scripture. John 17, verses 6 to 11. 
Don't forget what Joseph just said. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words that you have given me, and they have received them. I have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. Those of my father's house who are in the land of Canaan have come to me, Joseph said. Verse 32. And the men are shepherds, for their occupation has been to feed livestock. And they have brought their flocks, their herds, and all that they have. This is, in effect, Jacob's flock. It's, in effect, it's Jacob's flock. Matthew 15. But he, this is Yeshua, he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jacob's flock. Um, as I said, this, um, it's overflowing. This uh, epic saga of Joseph with messianic implications is just truly overflowing and you can't touch on them all. I hope I just highlighted a few for you. So we're going to return now to the beginning of the Parsha. But we're going to return now to Judah's perspective. Chapter 44 from 18 to 34 it is where Judah lays down his life in order to save others and to appease the Father. Matthew 10, he who finds his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. John 15, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. We are to be humble and put others before ourselves as our master has taught us repeatedly. Now Judah refers to Joseph as a king. See where he says, you are like Pharaoh, you are as Pharaoh. Judah is referring to Joseph as a king, but he's referring to himself and his brothers as servants. This is Judah putting his life to one side. Abraham did the same, he interceded for others. Isaac, he was willing to give his life for God. Moses, we know what Moses did. He even said, save these, you can block me out the book. He even block me out the book, but save these. Rahab, she risked her life. She gave her life for a godly cause. Esther, a young Jewish woman who risked her life to save others. There are many examples in scriptures. Here we see Judah putting his life down to save others. We have the ultimate, of course, which is Yeshua. He is the ultimate. But these are all types of Yeshua. I think so. How do we repay Yeshua? How do we repay the one who gave his life that we may live? We nagash. We draw near to him, become closer to him. We may not necessarily have to literally give our lives. Fortunately, thank God. But we are to be a living sacrifice daily. We are to save him. We are to do his will over ours. Because how, <coughs> truly, how can you repay that debt? And these are ways I try to do it. And I uh, hope we all do. Yeshua said the greatest love is to lay down your life for your friends. And we can be his friends if we lay our lives down for him. We are to live for others. Love God and love your neighbour as yourself. You see, well, it's all well and good saying that, but how do you lay down your life for others? Well, the scriptures tell us one example is you lend without reward. That's not necessarily your money, it could be your time, your energy, your thoughts, your compassion. Um to listen you know you, you could you could say come on tell me what what's wrong I, come on i'll listen to you you could listen but you're not really being attentive the samaritans are taught that when someone's speaking to them you've got to listen intently you've got to listen with attention you've got to shama you have to listen with understanding it's no someone's telling you and they're, they're telling you from their soul what they've been going through and you're just sitting there going yeah, yeah, say that again. What was that bit? 
Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. And you're looking out the window like that and going, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, to give of yourself is to give someone your attention, you know? It's all I'm saying, yeah, I can, I can hear you, and you're not listening. To listen is to listen with understanding, you know? That's giving of yourself. That's really, that's the Shama. And she said, well, is this being religious? Well, the mention, the, the mention of religion is in the scriptures, and the scriptures tells you what true religion is. So that's our guide. You want to be godly? What does God really want? Well, we read it in James. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble. Keep oneself unspotted from the world. This is the will of God, is to live for others. We are, we are to shama people. We are to love God and love our neighbour as ourselves. First John, for this is the message you heard from the beginning. It hasn't changed. It's, it hasn't, it stands forever. That we should love one another. This is how we live for others. This is how we give our lives for others. God says, this is the message heard from the beginning that we should love one another. And further down in uh, 1 John verse 16. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. We're always being tested, people. We are. <laughs> Joseph, it's... We can see the events of his life, but really they are all tests. Not to tip him up, but to refine him. Judah went through the same in a different way. He went through many trials and tests. Not to tip him up, but to refine him. And we all go through tests, we're always being tested. Look, his will, God's will shall be done anyway. It's going to be done anyway. With or without us. You know, so you best you get on board. You want to get on that train? Get on the train, get on board. His will is going to be done anyway, with or without us. Going back to Esther, in the book of Esther, her uncle, Mordechai, he understood this. He says to Esther, remember, because she had a chance to save the people, the Jewish nation, didn't she? And he says to her, if you remain completely silent at this time, Relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. In other words, it's up to you, Esther. He's going to save, the, he's going to save us anyway. But well, do you want to jump on board with this or not? Mm -hmm. His will is going to be done anyway. Mm -hmm. Best you get on board. Mm -hmm. God's will shall be done. Get on board. Shema Israel. Love God and love your neighbour as yourself. Shema Maybe finish the race and hear our Saviour say, Well done, my good and faithful servants. I tested you. You jumped on board. It was going to happen anyway, with or without you. Well done. Like Judah, we all have a past. And there's people we've wronged. And you can't turn the clock back. And it's not always possible, through different circumstances, to seek their forgiveness or to, to right the wrong. It's not always possible, as much as you'd like it to be sometimes. But if and when we draw near to God, Nagash, he can overwrite everything. He can overwrite it all. It's a clean slate. Our God, remember, is past, present and future. You know, we, we in our Western mindset, we tend to think of time as like a line going, like a straight line like that. There's the beginning, there's the middle, there's the end. That's not, time doesn't work like that. The Hebrews know this, Hebraically. It's not, we don't, time is not in a linear fashion. It doesn't lapse like that. Hebraic thought sees time as cyclical, cyclical. It's a circle. And there's no beginning, there's no end. And therefore, our deeds have ripple effects not only into the future, but also into the past. Our deeds today, like a pebble in, that makes ripples in the pond, and the ripples go in all directions, not just like on a line like that. 
Our deeds today can affect not only the future, but the past. As unbelievable as it sounds, don't forget, God knows what you require before you even pray. He is past, present and future. This is the God we deal with. Verse 30, 44, 30, Jude had interceding for bread, uh, Benjamin. Now therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad isn't with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life, he says, where it says life here twice, life, the lad's life, that's actually the word nefesh, which more often than not means soul in Hebrew. It means soul, most times it refers to one's soul. So in other words, since his soul is bound up in the lad's soul, nefesh. Now if you look at, I'm thinking of ripples in the pond here, how our deeds can affect through time. First Samuel 18. Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul, the nefesh of Jonathan was knit to the nefesh, the soul of David. Mm. Now, Jonathan's the type of Benjamin. David's the type of Judah. And a couple of verses later, verse 4. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armour, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. Jonathan here is from the tribe of Benjamin. He gives up his life as a future king for David side with Judah. Today in his pasture, we see Judah giving his life over for Benjamin. And then later in the scriptures, we see Benjamin giving his life over for Judah. This is how life works. This is how time is. Like ripples in the pond. Our actions affect the past, present and future. Like I said, before you ask, God knows what you require. Because he's past, present and future. So to conclude... This epic blockbuster that surrounds Joseph. We see in the words and deeds of Joseph many elements of Yeshua. But we also must keep in mind that, for example, sometimes jo uh, Joseph can even represent you or I. It's not always like, oh, this is Jesus again. He can represent you or I. We have to sometimes put ourselves in his shoes. It's not uh, what happens to us in life. It's how we react. It's how we respond to what's happening to us in life. Sometimes Jacob or Pharaoh or even Judah can symbolise the Father. Or sometimes it can be you or I. So we have to bear that in mind. It's not like Joseph Jesus all the time. It's not necessarily like that. It's not a static, fixed concept that Joseph is Jesus all the time. Or a foreshadowing of him. But that being said, it's difficult, nigh on impossible, to find a biblical character with more hints and references to Yeshua than Joseph. It's, it's, it's unreal. Um, Joseph, in his, in his making himself known to his brothers, is, is a type of Christ. Like Christ, he's their friend and their brother. He is the one they rejected and left for dead. He is the saviour who rescues them and the world. He assures them of his love and the riches of his grace. He commands them to put away malice and strife, don't be quarrelling, and to live in peace with each other. He teaches them, give up the world for him. He supplies all that they need to, to bring them home to himself, so that where he is, they may also be. In this past of Ayagash, Judah has come full circle and returns to the Saviour. He offers his life for the sake of Benjamin and consequently for the, the lives of the rest of the family is saved. Vaigash, Judah drew near to Joseph. Yeshua beckons us to come closer to him. This is what it's about. We need to come like Judah with a contrite spirit. And it's not too late. It's never too late. It's never too late. Judah came full circle, looked to the depths he got to. And we can too. The lesson for us, we all have a past and people we've wronged. When we draw near to God, he can overwrite everything. Our God is past, present and future. And therefore our deeds in the past 
present or future have ripple effects through time, in all directions through time. But just like Judah, we can rectify it. We can seek forgiveness and redemption. We can find reconciliation when we draw near to him. Matthew 11. Come to me, all you who are who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. James 4. Draw near to God, Nagash, and he will draw near to you. Wow. When you make a step towards God, he takes three towards you and he's got massive strides. Mm. He's got massive strides. Before you know it, he's there. <laughs> Nagash, draw near to him. It's the golden rule, folks, as always. It's the golden rule. It forever applies. Love God. Love your neighbour as yourself. That's Pasha Vayigash. Have a blessed week. Vaya con Dios. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shalom, I'm Jackie and this is Joe. We're from the Almond House Fellowship. A big thank you for staying till the end of the teaching. Just a little update on the Almond Grove project. This is a vision that's been given to us by Yah, where we hope to acquire a plot of land where we can set up a generational ministry. Hallelujah, this would be a place where we could host Shabbat, we could do weekly Bible studies, we could even keep the Moedim, the feast days there. It'd be a place where we could have biblical education without all the world politics or pushed agendas. We want to be to provide a place for agriculture and have ultimately a spiritual hospital for them that seek Yeshua. In the description you can find a GoFundMe link where we have a video explaining all them details and also the option to donate. And lastly if this teaching has blessed you and if you would like to tithe or bless our ministry you can also find the PayPal link in the description or email us for bank details and we can send them over to you. Thanks Jack. Yara has big plans on the horizon. All glory be to the Most High. So we're going to keep you guys updated as we go. So for now, from our house to your house, Shalom. <laughs>